Steve, can you tell us a bit about, um... Steve, can you tell us <laughs> <laughs> Is that good, isn't it? Steve, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry yeah. then, Steve, are you alright? Pat, isn't it? Pat Rock, eh? Hey? <laughs> Steve, mate, yes, yes. how old was you when you became a punk and how did you get into that then? Um, when was I? 18, because uh, I was living in Bristol with my brother. Um, and I think first I saw that uh, Sex Pistols interview with Janet Street Porter, which was on a Sunday morning, I think. And uh, and then there was a I was because I was working at a hospital at the time in, in Bristol, and one day this girl came in wearing really weird, well, I mean just like baggy trousers and you know plastic sandals and stuff. And I said to her, "You're a punk rocker," and she was like, "Yeah, this is really great music and all this." And I, you know, I just know, I didn't know where to go to see that sort of stuff. And uh, and then I saw the Clash advertised at the Colston Hall, uh, and I think that was seventy. Either late seventy six, no, it must be nineteen seventy seven. And uh, so I went along, and it and there, it was like just this room full of what I thought at that time was like really outrageous people. I mean, it was just people wearing school ties and like scruffy jumps and stuff. But if you look back on it, but I remember seeing the Clash on stage, and just being knocked out by it, you know, and I was like. Fuck, this is for me, you know. This here set of music is now dedicated to making sure that those people in the crowd who have children, there is something left here for them later in the centuries. And then Joe Strummer said the immortal words, if you think you can do fucking better, go and start your own band. <laughs> and I thought, I will. They said that we were trash. Well, the name is Crash, not Clash. They can stuff their punk credentials. You stem them take the cash. And I did. So, so yeah. how did you actually get around to starting your own band? Um, I came back to London to visit my mum and dad uh, and it was it was the week before the Queen's Jubilee um, and I visited a load of my old friends from school and the old pub that I used to go to and I said oh, I think of starting a band and they were like oh what are you into this punk rock thing and I was like yeah and they were going nah, that's a load of bollocks and all that like, we just going down to West Ham and all this and all you know. uh, so then I came over to visit uh, Penn because I knew him from years ago and, and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm thinking of starting up a band. I mean, I wasn't particularly serious about it. So then Penn semi-seriously said, well, I'll audition drums for you. And I was like, yeah, all right. So I, the first song I ever wrote was uh, Abbas Living. And uh, so he just played military drums to that. And we went next door and just did it on that. And that, the recording on Bullshit Detector is the first ever recording we did of it. And it was just like, well, it would work, wouldn't it? And we were like, yeah. So then Penn said, what should we call ourselves? And I said, Stormtrooper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a good job we didn't keep that really, isn't it? <laughs> All in black. <laughs> so, I mean, one shouldn't laugh really, but... <laughs> so, <laughs> and it all started from there. <laughs> Where was your first gig then? <laughs> It was a squatters festival, festival, in uh, Huntley Street, which was um, it was uh, Huntley Street is a it runs parallel between Tottenham Court Road and Gower Street in London. Uh, one side of it was all squats, and the other side was all rented and all this. <coughs> so the squatters were having problems with the local residents, and I can't remember over what. I think the evictions were coming up because Huntley Street actually got into the uh, national newspapers because there was a mass eviction with big mechanical diggers and stuff at Dong and all the barricades and stuff. Anyway, we went along there to play this festival and it was basically out the back of the buildings there was like a school playground type area and uh, there was about 20 people there and you know a couple of people walking around in sort of teddy bear suits and kids running around you know and we had four songs. We got as far as the third one and some resident came and switched us off and because uh, it was our first gig we didn't know what to do it's like all oh, right it switched us off a fitting end wasn't it you know so uh, yeah that was the first gig <laughs> yeah and was that the full uh, amount of crass in there was it just you and penny didn't it? no that was with me pen uh pete wright had joined by that time because the way the, that the band started was that pete would come over and say what you're doing and me and pen would say well we've got this new band together and then pete was in this 
I think a folk band at the time. And he said, oh, I'm pissed off being off in a, being in a folk band, you know. And I said, well, you ought to join us then. He went, oh, well. So he was on bass. Andy Palmer turned up. What you like to, we are starting a band. And he goes, I'll be in it. And so we said, well, can you play anything? He went, no. So, <laughs> so what are you going to fucking do then? <laughs> so Pete goes, I'll tune his guitar to an open chord. You can just put your finger over it and move it up and down. And in the fucking ten years that Crass was together, ever, he never learned to play one fucking chord. That case. <laughs> now, not one, not even a D. You know, the easiest fucking thing. No. So, um, and then there was this geezer, this old hippie geezer called Steve Herman. Um, and the connection with him was that he was at the inquest of Wally Hope when uh, G and Pen were at Wally Hope's um, inquest. He came over doing uh, uh, something. To, he had a video of Phil of Wally Hope at Stonehenge, and he just mentioned that he played guitar. You're in. So uh, when you see the photographs, it's such a bizarre collection. As it's Penny Rambo <laughs> sitting there behind his drums with his blonde hair and like all his black stuff on, very smart. And then there's Andy Palmer and his baggy black trousers and Dr. Martin's looking a bit of a knob playing like that. Pete Wright and his um in his Jesus creepers and cool joy, <laughs> cool joy semi flares, me in these jeans that have got turn ups up to me knees and, just, <laughs> and Steve Herman in this pair of plastic sunglasses, he had a bald red at that time, plastic sunglasses with flares and kickers or something and this horrible vest, the, with, remember those, it was like a black vest and used to have three stripes of colour Oh, Do you yeah, yeah. One of them, man. It just looks like that's not a punk rock. That's a fucking tragedy. You know? It's like <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> How the mighty have fallen. <laughs> this is what happens when the pimples burst. <laughs> oh, dear. Take a look at this. <laughs> is that why you decided to change your image then? <laughs> we saw those photos. Fuck it. Let's dress in black bollocks. <laughs> No, it was like Steve Irwin looks like we'll get him out, um, and it was it. I can't remember why we got rid of Steve Irwin. I can't remember why he left. I really can't remember now. Some argument we had with him, but anyway, that, that was the lineup at the time. Yeah, it was you know it was a full band at that time, but um, it, I think it was about three months before our next gig, and by that time, uh, Phil Freer joined and Steve. Um, um, Steve Herman had left, and I really can't remember why. I can't remember why at all. So how long did it take from the moment you all formed to actually putting out your first record then? Uh, we formed in April 77, uh, and Pete Stennett got in touch with us summer of 78, something like that. By then you'd done quite a few gigs. Yeah, I think it was picking up. I think we'd... Uh, no, in fact, no, we hadn't. Um, or had we? Yes, we had, that's right, because we... Because the first year, the first year of 1977, it, it was basically we played the Squats Free Festival, the first Roxy gig, um, which went really well, and it was really good. Um, and then we played Chelsea School of Art because Andy Palmer was going there. We cleared the hall, 400 people, out the door. I'll just turn around and say, one, two, three, four. Where's that gone? <laughs> just Bron standing there. You're really good, thanks. Um, <laughs> you're in the band, right? Um, <laughs> and then we played this. We played the second Roxy, Roxy gig, which was a fucking disaster. Because I, I just got so stoned and drunk. Oh god, before I went on stage, I was puking up in the street. I was like, that's the point. I usually go into bed. Like, no, nah, you've got to go on stage now. Um, did that? Pen dis left the band for 24 hours. <laughs> rejoined. It was so bruised and battered by the riot that went on down the Roxy that the next day we, we played uh, Covent Garden was still being demolished and done up and there was a festival at Covent Garden we played at that someone's got a video of that somewhere I don't know who it is with the drummer from the band called This Heat have you heard of them? Industrial mm. Music type band with him drumming so uh, and that was I think that was the extent of the get um, and then maybe Wimbledon or something. We only did about five or six gigs that first year. And then Pete Wright had met Charlie Harper. Now we're going on to, on to 78, 1978. Pete Wright knew Charlie Harper from somewhere. So we just um, found this pub in Putney, the White Lion, 
and the one the white line in Putney. And the subs were playing, then we were playing, we just watched each other, and that went on for about six months doing that. And then Pete Stanley got in touch with us and said, make a record, and we went, yeah. Well, we did do that, but you know, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> Because your records were cheaper than anybody else's at the time. Tell me about it, yeah. 45 pence for a single. you got to pay, pay VRT on that. What's VAT? Well, that means you're getting less than what you're selling out for. Oh, right. So we're actually losing five pence per record, are we? Yeah, that's it. Thanks for the people, that's all. <laughs> We can do business. People don't realise how disorganised it was at the beginning. Totally chaotic. It was just a matter Absolutely chaotic. Get everybody doing things and trying to get it all together. Yeah, I mean, even when, you know, even when we'd put out the first, like, the feeding of 5,000 and we were sort of getting known, you know, and people were actually coming to see Crass, I mean, we were still driving around in, in a, in a, um, an Anglia van, you know, a little box van and, an, and a little Morris minor van, you know, I mean, you'd be going to gigs in Manchester like that all the way. With a fucking amp sitting there, you know. Are we there yet? No, we're only doing 40 miles now. Oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Been in here for three hours and then you see a Northampton goes past. Oh, God. <laughs> but you used to practice here, didn't you? At the house, yeah, so, next door. So that made it easier for you then? Mm -hmm. you? Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean the, the thing is that this house, I mean, if it wasn't for this place, then it would have been... We wouldn't have been able to do it the way we did it because the rent here is really cheap and we had the room to practice next door. We've got no neighbours, so, you know, we can do whatever we like. And uh, once everybody came to live here, it just made sense everyone come and live here. I mean, you're on call every time, you know, so uh, the equipment was that we had was really cheap equipment. Um, we just covered it over with black material and painted it so it was all black and then put a symbol on it and all, just a smarty art, you know did all that but yeah um we just had room to do things you know and if it hadn't been if we'd like if we'd had to hire a rehearsal studio or something we'd never have done it you know or the, or the records would have had to be more expensive and how did you manage to live in those early days um well the records sold really well i was signing on at that time i think yes i was and doing odd painting and decorating jobs everyone was just like working and, and things uh, just whatever money came in, we all pulled it together. Um, at the beginning, we did used to take money from the gigs, but that was only like 20 quid or something like that, you know, it's like really peeling them out. But once, it was once feeding went into a second pressing, then we were actually able to start taking money off that and like, oh, can we take a tenner out of that, 100 quid for the rent, you know, and, and it just all sort of built up from there, you know. It was pretty quick, that thing, but... Was Penn working? Yeah, Penn was doing, I can't remember what Penn was doing. I think Penn was illustrating book covers. Um, Phil was working, Andy was working. Yeah, we were all doing our jobs and stuff, you know. So when you did start to get a bit of a notoriety and people started to come to your gigs, was you surprised by that? Or? Yeah, the first time I was, because that was at the Akram Hall. It was the first time I saw uh, someone walk in. I mean, he looked like a pretty heavy bloke, you know, and he, he sort of came in and just looked at me, and I looked at him, and he walked past and had crass written on his back. And I was like, fucking ding dong. And, and that's when I suddenly thought, maybe we could, you know, maybe we're gonna get somewhere, you know, like be sexist, you know, maybe I'm gonna be a pop star like Johnny Rotten or whatever, you know. But of course it didn't turn out like that. But, <laughs> but um, no, that was um, the first time, you know, I realised that we were having an impression on people. And um, and then because we got such bad, bad publicity in the press, um, a lot of people came to see us because of that, you know, including the Cockney Rejects, I think. But you deliberately went out with a political message, would you say, with your band, or what? You started going on about right wing, left wing, was because both the right wing and the left wing were trying to get us, you know, were calling and wanting us to be their spokespeople, you know. So like, oh, we don't have nothing to do with that, that's why we first put the anarchy symbol up there, because it's not political, you know, it's apolitical political and all this, and of course you get into a mess, you know. And that's what happened, but um, personal politics, I mean, basically all we ever did was wrote songs. Um, at the beginning it was like, oh, well, this will sound good, you know, and, and yeah, I, I like this song, and, you know, Pete, you've got a, got a bass line to put to this, like, punk is dead, you know, do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, it sounds good, yeah, yeah, that's right, punk is dead, yeah, it fits, you know. So, and that's why we used to do it, you know, it wasn't, 
it, we were just doing what we wanted to do, you know. It wasn't until later, you know, that we started, I don't know, not, not performing, not writing things because we thought, well, yeah, we did in a way, because in the end, you know, we were thinking, well, we've got to write a song that mentions this, you know, and we've got to write a song that mentions that. Like with Christ the Album, that double record set, we were in there, we, it took us, how long it takes to fucking record it? About three months to record it, you know, and mix it, and then we didn't like it, so we went in and remixed it, and that took another month, you know. And at the end of it, the Falklands Ward started, and we were like, shit, we've just done this double album, and there's not one mentioned the Falklands Ward in it, so I'm like, Duck. Okay, we go and do yes sir I will. So we did that in three days, you know, bang, tsh, what's that? Can't take my foot to it though, can it? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> Play that at the club. Clear the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but I think some of the the things that you were actually singing about and stuff, it did make people very aware of the issues, didn't it? And Yeah, and I think that's the way that we really saw ourselves was like an information centre really because uh, like Penny and G had come out of the 60s obviously and that experienced the sell out of the hippie movement and that being all market and the bad side of hippie you know and just sort of wankers going peace man you know all this sort of stuff but like I mean I think there was a lot of good things that came out of the hippie movement like um, alternative lawyers uh, organisations like Release um, um, clinics where, where young people could go to to find out about uh, venereal disease and abortion. And I mean, it sounds pretty naff now, but in those days, you know, it's only recently that these things are, you know, you're able to, you know, do these things. But, so it was really a good when, when they would say, well, we should speak about this, you know, and okay, if we're saying to people, live your own life, then we should at least show them how to bake a loaf of bread because if you've got no if you've only got 20 pence you can buy a bag of flour mix some malt with it and you made a loaf of bread you know and it's like it's that easy so you don't have to starve you know so you can be self-sufficient but of course the minute you put out a, a bloody leaflet that says how to bake your own bread oh you fucking wanky hippies <laughs> well can you bake a loaf of bread you bastard oh don't have to go to the shop and buy I'll piss off I'm a pacifist huh but you know it was like and that's what really pisses me off when people say that that Crass, you know, like I was saying to you at home, you know, says that we bought an air of ruralism, Crass bought an air of ruralism into punk. And really all we were doing was like, well, if we're saying to people, as punks, we should live our own lives, then, well, how do you live your own life? You know, you've got to be self-sufficient and, like, you've got to fucking eat, you know. If you've got no money... Well, at the end of the day, you sold thousands of records. Well, so yeah. Somebody must have agreed with Well, that's right, you know. Um, and I think that that's where, where Crass was successful, because we materially we weren't successful. We didn't we didn't make millions of pounds, you know, whatever money we did make, some it went somewhere, um, because when Crass finished, we were actually in the red, and I was thinking, well, there must be a lot of money, as you know, because we're selling loads of records from other bands, and like, where's the money? It had all gone, you know, because we used to give away badges, give away fucking posters. Put out, I mean, uh, like, for example, with the Poison Girls, we, maybe you shouldn't put this out live, but, you know, I'll, I'll carry on saying it, but, like, the, the, we did Chappaquiddick Bridge with them. I, was that their second record we did? And they were like, well, what about the money? So we said, well, OK, on the first pressing, you take everything. And on the second pressing, you take 70%, we'll take 30%. You know, and that's why we used to work. Yeah, that's what we fucking did with the Poison Girls. And what thanks did we get for it in their box set? No. Thank you, mm. you know, and that, that sort of thing really hurts, you know. And although we borrowed money off them to, to uh, start our own record label and uh, stations, you know, we actually borrowed a load of money off them, but we paid it back the next week because it just went wham, crashes big stuff, you know, it's like, so we just paid it back, you know. Um, oh, I've forgotten what I was talking about now. But do you think punk was a time for action and people actually getting up and doing things? Yeah, I think, it, you know, when it first started, it was just like, all right, dress up in strange looking clothes and be disgusting and get pissed and take drugs and da 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 da. But after that, it's like, well, I don't want to do this forever, you know, and I want to be a bit positive and, yeah, I do want to, you know, I do want to live separate from this society, you know, so how do I do that? You know, and, and people jumped on us again because we were living in this house in the country. We never ever said in any of our records or anywhere, this is what, this is how you should live. 
because some people it don't suit, you know, like Gary from Dirty, he couldn't live out here, you know, neither could Colin from Conflicts, you know, it's like, forget it, they're lost, you know, I can't like it, but like, it, it was just trying to say to people, you know, if you want to be outside of that fucking system, you know, you've got to be able to survive, you know, you, there's got to be an alternative to the dull, you know, for a start off. Yeah, well, do something creative that you can make money from, you know, and that sort of thing. But no, you know, because we live out in a nice place in the country, you know, we're just wankers, what do we, you know, you know. We've been to art college, I haven't actually, you know, but which turned into being to university. Yeah. <sighs> Wish I had, you know. But do you think um, at one time that the band was like, threat to society, I mean, did you feel I don't think it, I don't think it was a threat to society, I think it was a threat to the music business, we really, we gave, you know, I mean, really, really took them for a run and I think that the music business were really slow there, um, because they left the gap and we just nipped in there, it just worked like that, and uh, it was funny because I was thinking about this the other day, that if you look at a, a music paper from the 80s, you look in the alternative charts and it's all like Flux Pink Indians, Rebella Ballet, Annie Anxiety, God help us, you know, Conflicts and all that lot. <laughs> it's going to look good, isn't it? Um, no, I think we we just nipped in there, all of those bands, and it just happened at the right time. I mean, that, that's not going to happen again for a long time, you know, because the music business was sort of sewn it up. But, I mean, there was a point where Crash the band was selling more records than ACDC. And that is the truth, you know, actually selling more records. Who got in the charts? Not Chris, but, you know, so we were a threat to the music music business because it we showed it was possible to do that, that if you really wanted to do it, you could do it. You know, you could have your own record company, your own band, and have complete control, and you didn't have to make thousands of pounds. You could, you know, and, yeah, your mates could come up to you and say, can I make a single? Let's see, you know, what have you got a tape week in here? Yeah, it sounds all right, you know, yeah, we'll do it. Quite, you know, like the Snipers, I mean, that's not a brilliant record, but, you know, we're just all mates, you know, and that's the way it should bloody work, you know, try telling that to Derek fucking Bucket these days, you know, <laughs> one of my best old friends, you know, from uh, from Flux Pink Indians, won't even call me back on the telephone, why not, I'm his old friend, you know, and he can't say he's too busy, I'm always busy, but I can always call my mates back, so, and that's the way, it, you know, it seems to happen. So, but I don't think that we were ever a real threat to, to the system because I just think that's so big. Unless you're really into, you know, um, you know, blowing up motorway bridges and stuff like that, you know, being really bad, you know, I don't think you're ever really a threat, you know, you're allowed to have your little bit of rope and then that's it. You know, I think, I think there was a danger uh, when we did the, the, um, how does it feel single about the Falklands War? And that was mentioned in the House of Commons to Margaret Thatcher. And Tam Daliel from the Labour Party said to Margaret Thatcher, has the right honourable lady listened to the new record, how does it feel to be the mother of Then, And she totally ignored that part of the question. And answered the second part of the question. And then we started receiving on headed notepaper from the House of Commons letters of support from the Labour Party saying, oh, well, we think you're really good and keep up the good work and all this. And you knew that if it had been the other way around, we'd have been getting the same sort of letters. Yeah. But I started getting a bit nervous at that point because I thought, well, if we start getting too, if you start getting into that too much and becoming too much of a fucking noise and you actually become a pain in the arse to these people where it hurts, you know, I, I know what's going to happen. You know, I'm going to be coming out of the pub one night and then the car drawers up, bump on the back of the head, in the back, you know, and then Steve Ignorant would be found, you know, with a needle mark in his arm on a dump somewhere. Oh, yeah, he died of overdose. Or something, you know, where I'll just disappear and never heard of again. And if you step over that line, you know, which some people have done, you know, like John Lennon did. I mean, there was times in Crass that things did seem very difficult for you because you had um, the fascist skinhead turning up at your gigs and you did have things written about you in the papers. And you must have got, at times... You must have felt paranoid. But, yeah. I, I think that, because uh, when I go on stage nowadays, I'm still nervous and I think that's where it comes from because I don't think there was ever a gig in Christ when I wasn't shitting myself, basically, before I went on stage, um, expecting it to all go off, you know, and when it didn't go off, that was a really great gig, you know. Um, and, yeah, I spent basically eight years in Christ with my head tucked down between my shoulders and waiting for it to fucking start, you know. But, I mean, do you think the, the fascist skinheads turned up for their own back, or do you think they were coerced into coming by the music press and various things like that, just telling them to come and 
Yeah, I think they had a lot to do with it. I think that if it hadn't been for, for idiots like Gary Bushall, sort of just being stupid, cockney, chirpy, cockney geezer, you know, and this is what working class is, uh, it would, you know, because we had a really good rapport with skinheads, you know, when we first started, you know, it was like, um, you know, like you go to Europe now and it's sharp skinheads and you sort of get on all right with them, you know, you know it's still a bit, you're still not sure, you know, it's not, mm. but, you know, there's a sort of rapport there and we had a really good rapport with that lot. Um, and then when we played the Conway Hall, the Battle of Conway Hall, Battle of Red Lion Square, is it called now? <laughs> famous. Oh, it was there. <laughs> um, we were getting reports that these skinners were going to bang bricks at us off the roof and all this sort of thing. It was like, yeah, yeah. And there was always this mouthing off going on, you know, and a couple of characters were there who were threatening me and all this sort of thing. I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, I just want to do the gig, you know. And then the SWP burst in, smashed any of my short hair over the head with a bottle, you know, up the working class, then my short hair, short hair is a fascist and all this, and rushed off. The Guardian wrote up a report about that and said that um, it was the fascist skinheads that came in and caused the trouble. And it was like, from that point on, we had nothing but trouble, endlessly with skinheads, you know, and and because we never ever said fuck or fascist, none of our songs ever said, you know, you can look for them now and they don't say we don't like fascists, fuck off. I mean, if we're saying anything, all we're saying is left wing, right wing, you can shove the lot, you know, politics, like, we ain't fucking interested. It was other bands that came afterwards that went into this big, the fucking fascists, and like Dead Kennedys, you know, fucking Nazi punks, fuck off, or whatever it was, you know, pug on a Nazi and all this. But, you know, it wasn't our doing, you know, it's the same as vegetarian. You know, we're always getting blamed, you know, well, you're the ones who said, fucking don't eat meat. What song did I ever write that says don't eat meat? None of our songs say it, you know, it's like, it, you know, or, or Animal Liberation. Never wrote a song about it, except the one I wrote for Conflict, you know. It weren't us, but we're getting all the blame for it. You can't Blame it on Lin Linda McCartney, man. But do you think it was like, it was because all the things that you was, you was telling people that you was doing and you was capable of doing was new to all the... The punks, they didn't actually know you could do all those things, and it was like, I'm lost actually, I'm not saying. <laughs> um, no, because I think that, um, because we had an idea of what we were doing, you know, and by, that, by the time Crass had really, let's say by the time stations had, had been sold, you know, we had an idea of what we are doing, yeah, this is the direction we're going in, you know, this is what we're saying, and we're going to try and bring everyone's attention to nuclear disarmament, which is where CND comes into it, and the peace symbol, anarchy, and the real meaning of it. Da, da, da. So we had an idea what we are doing. People come to see you and they think, oh, that's a good idea. And then they go away and try and do it, and they go totally over the top about it, like they do in America, you know. I mean, apparently, punks in America are still wearing dog collars and fucking Mohicans and all that, totally over the top, you know, because of the, because they only get it second hand. So, I think that's possibly where it came from as well, you know, that that maybe the real misfits, you know, like the skinheads, you know, I don't know, maybe it's the fit kid in your class at school comes to a gig and that's all these people doing and he can't quite get into it and it's like, well, if I can't join him, you know, I'll fucking have a go or whatever. Or his big brother is, you know, National Front or, you know, and this lot of commies, you know, and it's all, it's just the way things happen at the time, you know, I think it, it, it just had to happen, you know, it would have been, it would have been weird if it didn't, really. And even when you went to Europe, did you find it was...? No, when we went to Europe, I mean, there wasn't any trouble at all. None at all. Um, no, none at all. Because I don't think they'd even heard of skinheads then, in Europe. At that time. <laughs> you used to enjoy being in a band then, touring and everything? Honestly? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like it now. It's when I think back and it's like, because I'm sure everyone's got this idea of like, oh, crash, you know, this really big band. You know? I mean, what it used to be was us all sitting in this Sherpa van, shivering our asses off, you know, drive, either having stayed around someone's house, house, I use the word tentatively, like an empty shell, you know, with like bare floorboards and where they've ripped the carpets up and the nails sticking up, you're sleeping on that, for like, fuck's sake. <laughs> For the people, by the people, fuck you know. And, uh, and there's me going, well, where's the hotels and shit? I'm sure it's time now, you know. <laughs> I've been doing it for four years. <laughs> yeah, it was that. And, I mean, um, talking to Gary from Dirt the other day, and he was, you know, he was reminiscing as well, and, and he was going, do you remember, you know, when we used to, all 15 of us would stop at a service station and we'd buy two loaves of bread 
and two plates of chips and just all make cheese sam uh, chip sandwiches and that would be it, that would be the dinner. And there was never any money around, you know. I mean, the amount of times I used to have to ask people for like, then there's 50 pence, I can get a bit. I'm in the fucking main band. Where's the money gone? To the benefit. Well, what's the benefit for? Oh, the donkey sanctuary. Great. Right. <laughs> well, I enjoy it. Hope those carrots choke here, you bastard. For the fuck's sake. <laughs> I mean, you can only go so yeah. far. So, no, I mean, it, looking back, yeah, it was a laugh, you know, but on the, on the other hand, I think we were really, in some ways, naive about it, you know. We were certainly not, business-wise, it was a disaster because the money just went, you know, and a lot of people made a lot of money from us. We're talking about 600 quid, 500, 600 quid a night, and that was in those days. What's that, 15 years ago, something? A lot of fucking money, you know, so someone did really well out of us. Um, but because, you know, oh, we have to stick to our principles, we were just to totally over the top about it, you know, well, not anymore, so. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you think at the time you were being ripped off? No, because it was just, that's what you were doing, you know, it was like, we're all in it together, we're all mates, you know, it's like, no, nah, we don't want the money, you know, no, nah, fuck it, you know, I'll eat when I get home, you know. It's only when you look back at it and you think, no, we could have really done something there, you know, we could have taken some of that money and, I don't know, do what the levellers did, you know, which is what we always wanted to do, which was actually take out a whole advertising holding and, and put a bloody crass message on there, you know. We never had the money to do it. You know, that's the sort of thing he wanted to do. But, uh... Did you yeah. get annoyed with, like, um, did you get annoyed with people imagining that you were rolling in money because of the amount of uh, record sales and stuff like that, the amount of gig, uh, gigs you were doing? Mm. Did that, like, did that like, uh, piss you off? Mm. Yeah, it used to really hurt me. Because um, it wasn't... I remember we did this... Um, we turned up to play a gig in... The only stipulation that Crash used to make was um, that the stage has to be at least three feet high. Um, because if it's any lower, it's just below your knees and the people at the front used to almost get their legs broken because the crowd would push and you'd see these people and it's like, oh God, their legs are gonna break, you know, so if it's three feet high, at least your thighs sort of stop it. So we went to play at Bradford and they'd said, yeah, the stage is all ready. And blah, blah, blah. So we turned up there in the afternoon, no stage, so, Where's the stage? Well, we've got these pallets outside, so not only are we the band sort of having driven all the way there, but we've got to fucking build the stage that we're actually going to play on for the privilege of playing the benefits, and these people take all the money anyway. So, dragging these pallets and stuff. And uh, this, the guy who organised the gig said, Steve, can I talk to you, you know, separately, like do a little interview sort of thing? And I said, yeah. Went to one side, and I'm surrounded by this semicircle of people, sort of like student types, you know, or maybe it's wrong to say that, but like real... Um, arty beard, you know, corduroy jacket types, you know. So, you know, what, 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 firing questions at me, and I'm like, what, what, what are you? And uh, their main thing was like, why are you charging uh, one pound to get in tonight? Could because there are a lot of um, unemployed people in Bradford. And I said, well, I don't think one pound is too difficult to get hold of. You know, I'm mean, even I get hold of that. You know, and I'm sure that people are going to have more than that because they're going to be up the bar later. Well, we've, you know, don't you think that you should have a separate queue um, so that people who've got dull cards can pay you only 50p and get in? I said, no, because it's like a benefit. And you know, who's going to stand at the door and say, right, shows your dull card? Because everyone's going to have a bloody dull card. And this woman sitting next to me goes, oh, all you're interested in is making your 300 quid and fucking off back down the motorway. Mm. Help, you know, you're surrounded by idiots, you know, and that sort of stuff used to really upset me because we weren't in it for the money and, and once the money started rolling, you couldn't stop it. You know, people were buying the product. What are you going to do? Oh, we don't want the money, just throw it away. Basically, we did, you know, because we did stupid things, you know. Some of the bands that we recorded, you know. I mean, I think we, st we got a lot of respect for what we did because we did stick to our guns, you know, and, I, and you know, we didn't sell out, you know, whatever that means because it means something different now, but we never did that, and we did what we said that we were going to do, you know. Um, and we did provide... We gave bands that would never would have been heard by anybody an opportunity to record, you know, put out a record, whether the record was crap or not is beside the point. We actually did that, and we did produce the bullshit defects of albums, you know, where people just playing on biscuit tin actually got an opportunity to put, you know, be on vinyl, and they still are. Um, but then the mob... 
um, were really upset because they said they'd been overproduced, you know, by Penny Rambo from going to the studio. And it's like, well, what do you want to do then? Just put your demo tape out or what? You know, it's like. Uh, um, and I mean, I think our mistake was that we always assumed that people that we worked with or came in contact with felt the same as us. So, uh, going back to One Little Indian, I mean, I always assumed that that um, at some point I would be able to go to Derek Burkett and say, well, I've got my demo tape here, you know, give it a listen, maybe we could do a record together. But I ain't even going to bother because, like, if the guy can't even telephone me back, you know, and I'm an old friend, you know, and I'm not phoning him up to, because he's putting Bjork out. I mean, she's an old friend, you know, from years ago. Anyway, you know, he used to come and stay here and stuff like, you know, ain't I the lead singer? I used to go drinking with him and stay around his house, you know. So it's not like I'm after this glory thing, it's just like I really would like a bit of help here, you know, to sort of put a product out. No, you know, and it's like it's all such big business now, you can't even get to talk to the geezer. You know, you've got to go through 15 secretaries or something, you know. At least with John Loder, for all of his faults that people say he's got, you can still get through to him. Any of us, you can get through to us on the... So it's like a real shame, that. You know, and, and that really surprised me. Because I thought that, well, if all these people are starting up record companies, you know, record labels, then, yeah, we've got a real chance of, like, starting a network where, where there's endless cheap records coming out, you know, and we can just work on this. And um, who needs the major record labels? But it didn't turn, you know, everyone fucking got bought out. You know, or, you know, sold up, or whatever it is. And did you have any good times with Chris then? <laughs> yeah. We did as it goes. The best one was when, uh, I think the, my favourite time with Crass was the first van we had was a, a blue, I can't remember what it's, a J4 it's called, and it's a really old flat fronted van with sliding doors, right, and, a, and the bit in, in the middle where the gear leave you, that was the engine cover, so someone had to sit on it, we all ended up with piles right, off the top, in my arse up. So, and it always had a slipping van belt. Like this. So we go off to Liverpool, and <laughs> I've been to Liverpool a few times, so I said to the rest of the crowd, if you're asking directions, don't open the doors, just open the windows, right, because they're really fucking leery up there. Yeah, so off we go up to Liverpool, like this gig, driving around the back streets looking for Matthew Street. Pete, right, oh, there's some people, I'll ask them. Switches off the engine. I was like, no, don't do it. Opens the door and goes, Oi, mate, can you tell me where Matthew Street is? And these guys come around and go, Scotland, Scotland. I'm like, oh, no, you can't. <laughs> so the bloke comes up, What do you want, mate? And tell me where Matthew And the bloke goes, I'll have those. Tries to grab the keys. The Pete goes, Fuck off. And the bloke goes, Pop, pop, pop. Just starts hitting Pete in the in the face, right? So she goes, Start the van. <laughs> By which time these blokes are trashing the van. I looked up, this bloke's fist smashed through the window. I'm like, Oh no, we're going to get killed. Penny Rambo is in the front of the van, feet on the dash, like, with a fag, and he goes, I rather think you should start the van, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> and these blokes going, <laughs> Like, Start the fucking van. God, that was great, God. That's really good times. No, that was, that was exit. I mean, I couldn't help laughing even at the time because it was like, you've been framed, take a look at this. Crastic then came to a nice, comfortable gig. <laughs> <laughs> and then the skinheads turned up later. So you go, don't bother, mate, we've had enough today. Like, you ain't even gonna fucking ruffle the surface. Oh, right. <laughs> but no, they were good times. I mean, it's... <clears throat> Not really concerts that I remember so much, but it's like the people that we met, you know, and, and people that I'm still in contact with, you know, and people that I've, I don't know, not in contact with, but they're still around, like um, Rodney Relax and the Scottish Light, you know, the, the alternative. Uh, you like, you know, Rubella Ballet and Gary from Dirt and all, and they're all still around, all still doing things, you know. And that's the best bit about it. Because that, you know, I mean, that real friendship, you know, it don't go away, does it? So do you feel like you, made, you actually made some real friends while you were doing your stuff? Mm. Some real friends? Yeah, and, and I think that all the people that were involved in that stuff at that time, no matter what they're doing now, they're still, they've still got those sort of principles. You know, there's still that basic, I don't know, none of them are capitalist bastards, well, apart from a few that I've already mentioned, but, you know, I don't think I need to rub it in anymore, Derek. And do you remember the way that some of the women were at the time? Did they make an impression on you, the punk women? Did they seem different from 
of people at the time, other women at the time? Well, although even, because um, like in Crass, you know, the, the women in Crass were putting forward their message and I was like supporting that and trying not to be patronising and, and still trying to be a sort of young bloke, you know, and sort of being really confused about it and all the rest of it. You know. um, I always felt that what was lacking in punk <clears throat> was that it never actually achieved. Um, you know, women were never equal within that because it not a lot of. I mean, there was always more men than women at gigs, for ex for example. You know, and I don't know. Maybe women didn't like the music so much, or whatever. You know, maybe they were elbowed to one side. But I don't think it ever punk ever um, achieved that equality with women, even though that's where the the message from from women for women was coming from, and not just from Crass, but like from all different people. Um, and it's the same with, with uh, black and white, you know, I mean, it, punk never ever achieved that black and white together, you know, and the I think the only thing that's achieved that up, up to date is the rave scene. I think that's the only place where everybody's equal within but Do that. you think the rave scene is, um, I mean, to some extent, the the crest scene and that scene around punk then went on to Travellers and, you know, the crusties that we used to call them and all that and that's do you think that's gone on to the rave scene? Or? I think that a lot of the people involved in that are people that were around at that time and have used all that knowledge and, and information and, and that's what it's culminated into uh, and I, I you know I don't think it's crash started it or anything but you know it's from that era you know um, just that's the way it's all gelled together you know and, and crash was the starting point you know um, or, you know, all the other people that are around at that crash time is what I mean, you know, because I don't think that we were responsible for anything, for, for everything, you know. But um, um, at the time, you know, I, I remember thinking at the time, you know, well, it's all very well, you know, the 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 women sort of saying their piece, but, I mean, where are the women, you know? I mean, you never really saw many women at, at punk gigs, you know, as, as far as... Or as they all have bloody boyfriends if they were. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we would come back from um, the last gig we did, we were in the van and we all goes, well that was a good gig wasn't it, and uh, yeah, and Annie Palmer goes, I don't, know if, I don't think I want to do it anymore, and like, because we were, I think because we were all tired from the gig and because we were all tired from touring and it was like, Phew. no I don't think I want to do it anymore either, and it's like everyone sort of agreed and it was like everyone had been thinking about it, got back here and it was like, Oh, it's just one of those things you say when you, you know, I'm going to leave the band and all this sort of, and you never do, you know, that sort of thing. But no, I mean, Andy Palmer came out here one day and he said, no, I sort of, you know, I want to find, you know, I want to have a relationship with, with Lou now, you know, and, uh, and I can't do it with Chris, you know, I just sort of want to knock it on the head. I was like, okay, cool. And we did, we did one rehearsal with that Andy because we thought, well, maybe we could carry on. And it was like, oh, what's the fucking point? You know, it's time to stop, let's stop, you know. It's, uh, so and I, I was like, oh great! Now I don't have to do it anymore. Three weeks later, oh let's get the band back together, please, please. No, no. I was like, oh, right, you know. So and it literally was that. It was like as Crash started, you know, that easily. You know, just a bunch of mates being together. That's how it finished. You know, it was like, well, do you want to carry on? No, not really. You know, I'm fed up with it. You know, it's like, uh, you know, and it, and um, I mean, that sounds really flippant. But I mean, all of us were just like, at the end of it. We were so fucking miserable, you know, such uptight, bitter, unsmiling bastards, you know. And it's because we'd had eight years of of that imagery, you know, like G would would do the videos for, to show at, at concerts, and it would all be the worst aspects of our society, you know, like people being blown up or shot, or Northern Ireland, or people starving, you know, homeless people. Um, 
and the bits that you'd put in between the songs, were, the songs you were writing all about the bad things, there was the Falklands War, the fucking Tories had got in again, you know, there's fucking problems with the skinheads, you know, there's problems with this, problems with that, and it was just all, and suddenly you realise, Jesus Christ, I'm sitting in this dark bloody cell and I've done that to myself, you know, and like, fuck it, I want to see my life now, and I want, you know, I want to have a laugh, you know, so, I think we were just so burnt out by it, and I think that shows in the last records that we did, you know, like, um, Yes Sir I Will, that's just a horrible, f I mean I quite like that record because of what it's saying, but like sound wise it's just like, Jesus Christ, someone's got a problem there, you know, and um, you're already dead, you know, and that's the most bitterest fucking thing, you know, that we did, it's really scathing, you know, and, it's t and I also remember one of the last gigs we did, being on stage, um, this was at Exeter, and I think we were about a third of the way through the set and I suddenly realised I'd been daydreaming. And I'd, but I'd just been going through the motions, I'd been singing and doing the actions, you know, and looking like I meant I was doing it. But I'd just been totally thinking of something else. And I suddenly thought, that's really bad if I'm doing that, you know, it's like... Because you've got to mean it. So, and I do mean it now. So, what did you start doing after press? Did you start feeling a bit lost? Or? Um, well, obviously, after Crash had finished, I was like, right, that's it, I don't want anything to do with it now, you know. Da, da, da. But um, then, I, because the last year of Crash, I'd, I'd been to New York and I'd been to visit some friends, and I was down at Coney Island, and these, these black people came past with what now wouldn't be classed as a ghetto blast, one of those little twin cassette things, with this amazing music coming. And I was like, what the fuck is that? That's amazing. And I followed them and I said, what, what is that music? And they said, oh, it's scratching. And I said, what the f what's that? And they said, yeah, you know, you get a record and you, you know, do this to it and you get it. I was like, fuck it, no, that's brilliant. You know, so I came back to England. I was like, fuck it, I've got to get hold of some of this scratching. I think it's called scratching music, you know, and rap hadn't been heard of over it at the time. So I was going around everywhere trying to find rap music, scratch music, and then of course Grandmaster Flash appears in Africa Band Bar, so I'm like, kaboom, big time. Da, da, da. You know, I've been saying to John Loder, you know, I want to do a rap record, I want to do a rap record, and he's like, Steve, it's never going to get anywhere. Eat your words, John, if you'd only known, mate. Um, so I did this record, I did a 12-inch uh, single called Take Your Always Off The Table, which was going to be a benefit for the American Indians, because that's what it was about, you know, sort of civilizations being fucked up by progress. And uh, that never appeared. I can't remember why. Oh, because if, it is, if it's not on the shelves in the record stores, it's not losing money. So then, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and then I did a couple of, of things with a, a outfit called Current 93. It was sort of industrial music, uh, I don't know, just like weird sort of stuff, you know, atmospheric and, you know, avant-garde, bang, crash, wallop. Yeah. And uh, and then I decided that I wanted to do a single, so I, then I approached Conflict and said, how about doing a single together? And that's when I joined with Conflict. And then Colin goes to me, well, how about just doing a gig together, like a really big gig? And I, and I, I got into that and I was like, yeah, it could be quite a good thing to do because there was nothing happening at that time. And it was like, well, let's do it in the biggest place we can, you know, Brixton Academy, and we'll just do it for no reason, we'll just see if we can do it. And so the gig went off, you know, in all aspects of the word. Uh, but I, I realised that I really enjoyed performing on stage, so I stayed with Conflict, thinking, well, because i have written new songs and stuff, you know, and it seemed to be working, you know, and there was always the promise of an American tour or this or that or whatever, you know, so it seemed worthwhile. But after two years of it, you know, I'd, it wasn't progressing enough for me. And I, because I joined the band and basically Conflict is Colin's band or Colin and Paco's band, you don't feel that you can say, well, I think we should get 15 trumpets in on this and, and or we should do this or whatever, because it's their band, you know, and I thought, well, if I'm going to do that stuff, it's better that I leave and do my own thing. So I left and started Schwarzenegger, so, which still didn't do what I wanted to do, but, you know, at least I tried, so. What do I end up doing? Bloody doing it in Manchester. <laughs> Christ. Still, I'll do it one day. But you've got something coming up now, haven't you? Yeah, Stratford Mercenaries. Where are you going to be playing? America. <laughs> yeah. Is but I've, I've played America before with Crash. But it's not just music you've been doing for the last couple of years, is it? 
No, it isn't, is it really? <laughs> did you really bake all those? Yes, I did. I made them all myself. Yeah. Made them all myself. So go on, ask me why I did it. Because after uh, after I'd left conflict, I thought, what am I going to do now? And I thought I would still like to do. I'd just like to do a record, you know. And I thought, what can I do about it? It's something I'm really interested in. And I've always been interested in Jack the Ripper. Right? So I thought, I'll do a record on Jack the Ripper. And then I saw Spinal Tap and I thought, no, I can't do a record on Jack the Ripper. It's too Spinal Tap. <laughs> so, see Jackie. <laughs> so I thought, what can I do? And then I've got this book and um, it's got this old Victorian script of Punch and Judy in it. And I remember seeing Punch and Judy when I was a kid and being quite frightened of it because it was so bizarre. And I thought, that's what I'll do a, um, a record of, so I, I actually used this and I, I wrote out a script, which I've got up there somewhere, I could show it to you. Uh, but then I thought, well, just for insp inspiration, I'll make a Mr. Punch, so, you know, I'll look at it when I need inspiration, so I did that. And I thought, well, it'd be quite, ni quite nice to have a whole set of puppets for the kids that come over and they can play them. So I did the other ones. And I thought, well, it'd be quite, ni quite nice for them to actually have the little booth thing, you know, to sit in. so I did that. And I thought, well, I might as well bloody try and do it. So I did, you know, I got the swizzle and did it, and it was great. And suddenly someone said, you can earn 75 quid a show doing that. And I was like, oh, I'm interested. So, <laughs> so that's what I did for three years. No, longer than that. Fucking four or five years I've been doing it. It's the, and I'm good, too. One of the best. you just done festivals in Britain, or...? Um, well, I do. There's the Auburn Festival that I do every year at the seaside. Um, that's every August, and um, there's the Charles Dickens Festival I do at Rochester. But I spent about um, three or four years doing private parties, going around to people. You know, I went for an entertainment agency and went into people's houses, and that was quite good. But there was something a bit um, horrible about it because you go in there and all you're doing is supplying a. You're just a service, and it's not. It works that if the kids enjoy it, the parents enjoy it. If the kids don't enjoy it, the parents don't enjoy it. It's just this weird thing and they get upset about the hanging scene, you know, and it's too violent and all this bollocks, you know. But, and then they are letting their kids watch Bleeding Blade Runner or, you know, Terminator. It's like, and the puppet show is too violent. Come on. Christ alive, you know. But it's really weird because it's... I mean, I, you know, you say, oh, it's only a puppet show and all this, but it's like, when you look back into the history of it, it really fits in with what I've been doing before because, you know, Mr. Punch, the original anarchist, you know, he's like the cripple that wins with a hunchback. Basically, the show is about choosing your own path in life and there is no authority but yourself, to quote Crass and to quote Punch. So he's got a logic for a child, so to get rid of anyone who tells him what to do, he'll just kill him to get rid of them. Plus, it's an easy way of getting rid of that puppet off your hand, you know, smack, and it's gone, bring up the next character. So, um... It all seemed to fit in. It wasn't a deliberate thing. Oh, you know, I was doing crass, so that makes sense to do Punch and Judy. But I just sort of got into it. But uh, it, it, take us through the uh, characters that you've because uh, you made this yourself, haven't you? Yeah. Well, this is obviously that's Punch, um, and he's got a hump on his back because he's got the he's got the hump with the world because he's a cripple. Um, he's got a red nose. Uh, because it looks rude, as the, that's why he's got this, everything about him is like a penis, you know, it's like a phallic symbol. And kids really like that because when you poke it, up, when you poke it up behind a thing, it just looks, it's obvious it's a knob, you know, so the kids are like, ah, it's a knob, you know, you know. So, um, that's him, that's the baby uh, that gets thrown out the window, and I made it deliberately ugly so that no one would get upset because the baby's being thrown out the window. Um, that's his wife, Judy who so hits Punch first, and then he hits her back. Uh, I mean, you know, I just thought he punching you, didn't you? For God's sake. Oh, God. Well, basically, she, uh, she comes in, asks Punch to look after his baby, so Punch says, OK, I'll look after the baby while you go and get me a bottle of gin. So Judy goes down to the, to the pub to get a bottle of gin. While she's away, the baby wets itself on Punch's lap. And in disgust, he goes, what a dirty child, and throws it out the window by accident. Judy comes back and says, where's the baby? So he says, it fell down the stairs. She says, you threw it out the window, didn't you? And the kids go, yes, he did. 
and Punch says, don't worry, plenty more where that came from. So she goes and gets the poker and hits him with the poker. So he takes the poker, hits her back, throws down the stairs. Next door neighbour comes up and says, I can't sleep because of all the noise that's going on. If you're not quiet, I'll fetch a policeman to arrest you. So Punch says, you and whose army kills the next door neighbour. Um, and the next door neighbour is left lying on the... I'll have to explain as we go along if, if that's the thing that the next door neighbour is left... Maybe I should do it. So he knocks out the next door neighbour. So then the policeman comes, has Mr Punch been naughty, has Mr Punch been wicked? Yes he has, uh, I've, I'm going to arrest you and take you off to prison. Oh no you're not, so he gets killed as well and stays there. So then up comes the judge who says, what's this I see before me here? Has Mr Punch been naughty? Yes he has. Hello, now there's one poor fellow, now there's two poor fellows, crack on the back of the head, there's three poor fellows. So then Punch says, right now stay there, don't move. So he's looking, Punch is looking over there, the clown comes up. Um, and starts to move the bodies, Punch turns round. So every time Punch turns round, he disappears again. So eventually he moves it like that. Punch turns round and puts himself in. So the clown's in there. So Punch says, I'll count them. So he goes, one, two, three, and the clown goes, four. So Punch says, no, I'll count them again. One, the clown moves in, so he goes, one, the clown takes one. Two, three, four, five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. So it's a complete fuck up. He can never reach the same figure twice. So he just smashes the lot. They all go off. Tries to get the the clown who never gets hit. He never gets hit. Um, and then the clown disappears and says, um, "Well, the only reason I came up here was to tell you that there's a nasty crocodile looking for Mr. Punch. So if you should see this crocodile, shout out here he is as loud as you can." So the kids get into it, and up comes the crocodile, bites Punch's nose. What's all the noise going on up there? Uh, I need a doctor, so then the hangman appears. And the hangman says, um, because you've been so nasty and wicked, you have to hang by your neck till you're dead, dead, dead. So Punch says, bread, bread, bread. No, not bread, 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 dead, dead, dead. What for? For throwing your poor wife and baby down the stairs. No, I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> so um, Punch says, where shall I put my head? So the hangman says, in the middle. So Punch says, I don't know how to do it, can you show me how to do it? So the hangman says, shall I show him what to do? And of course, all these innocent little boys and girls and Christian people say, yes! So the hangman puts his head in the noose and Punch hangs the hangman. So, um, <laughs> end of show. Wah, 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 Where's all the crumpets, see? Um, but, um, I mean, the thing is that, that um, it sounds really, I mean, you can't get the idea of what the show is unless you've seen it, you know, maybe you should come and film me doing the show, you know, if you get the chance, it's totally different. But, I mean, basically, Punch became, <clears throat> in the late um, 1800s into the beginning of this century, Punch was like a real f working class hero because he was the only person who could knock down a policeman and not get arrested for it, who could actually trick the hangman into his own execution and just get away with it, you know, he could beat the wife up and get away with it, kill the kid, you know. At that time, everyone was having kids, like, fucking kids, you know. <clears throat> Everybody wants to do it at some point. Fucking... So, um, sometimes in the show, you'll see the doctor, and the reason that the doctor was, was always bashed about in Punch Duty shows was because when um, criminals were executed at the gallows, the doctors would um, use the, the bodies of executed criminals for dissection, so they were hated by the, the working classes. Um, at the time he came a, became a folk hero, what really did it was because most people in, in those times, I mean like the last, one of the last hangings that went on was a kid that was walking past a shop, a printer's shop. He was 13 years old and this is in 1857 or something. <clears throat> and he just had a stick and he saw the window was broken so he just put his stick through and pulled out a bit of printer's ink and he got hung for it. Hung for it, Fifth, fucking 14 year old kid. So, and that was, I mean there was over a hundred slang words for gallows, you know. So most people were thinking, well I'm not going to make it past the age of 21, you know, I'm actually going to hang on the gallows, you know, end up on the gallows. So when he actually put, you know, Jack Ketch into his own noose, yes, fuck, you know, it's like hanging Margaret Thatcher or something, yes, you know, everyone loves it. And that's where it all comes from, tradition, you know, it's a real, um, there's a lot of little bits and pieces that have been lost now. But there's another, um, in one of the old scripts of Punch and Judy, which ties up nicely with the Falklands War, um, 
there was a character, the blind beggar, where the blind beggar would knock on a door and punch would open the door and the blind beggar didn't realise the door had been opened so he'd knock and punch his face and punch say, who are you hitting? And hit the blind beggar. So, and he'd say, I've lost my sight in the sands of Egypt. Give us eight and for a blind beggar and punch say, I'll give it fucking eight and right back to the geezer. But um, where that comes from, I lost my sight in the sands of Egypt, was when the British forces were deployed against Napoleon. In Egypt, there was a sand fly that gave you a disease of the eye, and it led to blindness, you know, temporary or permanent. When the English soldiers came back from France, they they weren't given from Egypt. They weren't given any pension. They were just left to be beggars on the street. Fight for your country, fucking joking, and yeah, you know? which is the same thing as what what happened with the Falklands War when the veterans came back, and people who been blown up, had bits missing, weren't allowed to take part in the victory march because the sight of them might upset people. And it's the same, so there's a lot of little references in there that I thought, you know, it sort of fits in, you know. But like, the, the site, we've just had a war with Argentina, a war, and someone with a bit of their leg missing might upset us. I thought that was what war was about, funny enough, people being blown up and shot to bits. Mm -hmm. So you turn up and pack up now. So I need to wrap up now. Hmm? You, you need to do a finishing comment. You did it. Mm -hmm. Like, thank you very much, Steve, for letting this come around. I ain't doing that, bollocks. As in, now? What, thank you very much, Steve, for letting this come around? That's a pleasure. <laughs> she says intimidatingly, <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Steve! <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of that? You didn't want to put your whole thing on it. <laughs> put that out of context. <laughs> That's going to sound really weird, isn't it? <laughs> American woman came to stay here. Oh, I've just seen her go to the bottom of your stairs. Oh, really? What did it look like? And I, oh, it was a sort of figure with a monk's robe on. Oh, really? it's a penny. It's yeah, it's never a painter and decorator or, you know, just some bloke <laughs> fixing a pie. It's always a monk or something like that, isn't it? It's like, you know, or Napoleon. Right. But um, a weird thing did happen to me. I'd, a few times it's happened. I've walked into a room and, like, um, I've just, like, oh, airs have stood up, you know. And, or my mouth's gone dry and got a metallic taste, you know, but I've never seen anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, if there is, I mean, I'm, I suppose there is, now, huh? You would have thought you'd seen it by now, wouldn't you? Yeah, and I suppose, you know, if there is something here, then, you know, I think it's pretty friendly, I don't think it's there, you know. Mm -hmm. I thought you said you're 42 now. No, I'm 39 now. Are we talking size or age? <laughs> I, thought you'd, I thought you said, I thought you was 42 now. No, I'm 30. And he goes, no, no, I've actually seen quite a lot of people. <laughs> no, I'm 39 now. No, you're not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 30 fucking nine. So tell us about the adventures you used to have with Rachel then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the great Rachel Ashworth. Tell us about I was the few drinking emporiums you've been to. I was an innocent young punk um, playing at the White, the White Line in Putney with the UK subs, and I was bullied by this fucking woman called Rachel Ashworth into having a relationship with her. She literally came up and said, we're going out now, and I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't know what to me, I was going for that one. <laughs> no, she came up to me and she said, I'm only saying this because it's, obviously Rachel's gonna see this. She borrowed my gloves one night, and I was like, I quite fancy Rachel. And uh, I don't know if she fancies me though. So, and then she came back and she said, "Oh, where's your gloves back?" And uh, I met some bloke on Putney Bridge, and she said, "Oh," you know, and she said that he had said that he had met Stevie, and she went, "I've got his gloves on." <laughs> and um, and we started going out together. But little did I know what <laughs> what going out with Rachel Ashworth meant. I mean, like God Almighty. <laughs> Colin from conflict, all is forgiven. Christ, we goes into this pub in, in East End. <laughs> the camera on, see. It's a bit better if you're excusing Colin from conflict, isn't it? It's <laughs> gonna be a complete dark somebody. We went in that pub down at, on Catherine Road, round the corner of your mum and dad's house. And you know, you used to get really big blokes in there, like big necks. Like, I mean, big blokes, on, and then me, like a spike here. Yeah, all right, mate, how's it going? Like, you know, can I come in your pub? Yeah, if you're quiet. All right, I won't say boo. Rachel's standing there. Who are you fucking looking at? And this geezer goes, I'm looking at him. Well, don't fucking ever go at him. Ever go at a night, 
that's my girlfriend, offering these blokes out. And I'm like, shut up. They're gonna, and they're all laughing. They go, would you fucking say? I didn't say a word. She said it. I'll fucking have you. Leave off. Christ, I'm going home to Epping. <laughs> God, I used to get on that train at East Ham. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then Rachel would find us, are you coming out tonight? <laughs> oh, where are we going? <laughs> yeah, um, I thought we'd go to the disco in Sid Cup. <laughs> So you do, um, so you had, you frequented um, quite a lot of uh, strong women then when you were. When you were <laughs> Certainly <home>. did, <laughs> and uh, funny enough, around about that time, I got a strange yearning for pickled onions. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they all, mate? <laughs> yeah, that's on Rachel. Mm, pickled onions. Yeah.